back to Broken and Brilliant. I'm Carrie O'Toole from Carrie O'Toole Ministries, and I've got a special guest with us today, Mary Ellen Mann. Welcome. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Well, this is kind of a funny little thing at the beginning, just to introduce you and tell you how tell everybody how I know you. But Mary Ellen was my counselor for I don't know how many years, probably. Was for about nine, uh, three years. Nine years. Um, I think we met back. <laughs> Eight or nine years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. you walked me through, I mean, the darkest days of my life. I mean, I don't, I truly believe that, I, I think you saved my life. I mean, I'm not sure what would have happened, mm -hmm. but I just was so lost. Mm -hmm. It just, life was so chaotic. Yeah. And I was struggling with anxiety and depression yeah. and sleeplessness. And, you know, when all those three things pile on and the circumstances of your life don't get better quickly, it can sort of, it becomes very dark and very um, hopeless. And mm -hmm. sometimes you just don't know how to even go from day to day. Right. And I remember sometimes just thinking, okay, I have an appointment on Thursday. I can make it to Thursday. <laughs> So anyway, thank wow. you, and I'm just thrilled to have you here. Well, it's an honor, and um, you know, and I haven't really seen you in about four or five years. So um, I think that the woman you are today has so much to do with your tenacity to pull through something where there wasn't any daily hope. You weren't given any, um, you know, real tangible signs that the efforts you were even making in counseling <laughs> were going to produce anything, and yet keeping the faith and putting your left foot and your right foot each time, um, I think it's brought you here today. And well, I was just going to ask, it. this is kind of a weird it's a question. Real, yes, it's a real gift. <laughs> but do you, I mean, I feel like I look different. You do, do. Is there a difference? Totally. Um, well, you're walking differently. Um, you, you know, you walk upright, it looks like you have something you look for, you look forward to your life, you look forward to your own thoughts, and I think we don't look forward to our own thoughts, we don't like what's going on in the turmoil inside is telling right. us something that's not true, we're not important, we can't, we can't get through it, there are no choices, you know, but I think that you have exercised choice. Yeah. to the fullest capacity well I, I do I don't think you can just do it by yourself sometimes you know I think today's podcast I would love to be for those people who are just right. struggling mm -hmm. in the depths of it where you feel like I don't know if I can do it today I just right. I just don't know if I can even get up and I remember having those days and there were days I didn't get up you know I it was just like Right. Get the kids to school. I'm I'm back in bed. Yeah. I just can't even face it. I can't do it. I don't have the energy. Mm -hmm. I can't even get my eyes open. I don't have the energy to put on clothes or mm -hmm. whatever. It was just so so difficult. And so I want I want to provide some hope. And maybe we can talk about that when people are in those different places. What are the types of people that you see in your practice? What leads people to this dark place? Well, I you know first, anyone who's been my client for a while knows <laughs> that I always say I have the best clients that have ever been born and brought to the planet. So I'm very proud of my clients. So you don't see them all as whack jobs and crazy close, loons? Not even close. In fact, in fact um, you know, I can see why counselors have to have ethical standards for not having a social life with their clients because in so many ways, clients are so delightful and open and available to learn. And who doesn't want to be around people like that, right. you know? And so I often say it's for, you know, therapy is for the brave and mighty and for the people bold enough to face something and open up to someone. And oftentimes they're stepping into a, a trusting, uh, an alliance where they're asked to trust a, a stranger. And a lot of times they have not had trusting relationships in the past. So that's that's where some of their struggles are coming even from. more heroic in my right. mind. So I, I guess I believe that the people who I get to see, it's a privilege, it's an honor, and I consider them heroes. And they're unsung heroes because they're willing to say, you know, my trust has been broken, but let me try again. You know, I mean, to me that is just athletic. It's it's Navy SEAL, you know. Well, and it's so, so interesting so proud of the to hear you I say that because I think in society there's such a stigma. Mm -hmm. I know. And it, it's, it seems like it's coming down some, mm -hmm. but... It's still there, and it's like, oh, it's the weirdos who go to counseling, or it's the sickos who go to counseling. And what I found is it's actually the the stronger people and those who are really yes, yeah. willing to deal mm -hmm. with their stuff. And there's it's so much easier to just sit and do nothing. 
Well, and I think our society shows you that. The people who, who get help, who need help and get help, what we don't know is what we're preventing. You know, mm -hmm. and I think society and the news will show you when you don't get help, this is where this can go. Um, and, and while I don't think, you know, therapists are the only catchers in the eye, so to speak, we're not the only ones right. by any stretch helping out humanity. We are a significant piece, in, along with coaches and teachers and parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and other mentors out there. Right. So, so we, we what we just don't know at this point is what has therapy prevented in society at large, and and also what has it allowed us to gain in society. So, what I often see is that clients are coming in. Uh, with maybe a keyhole size awareness of who they're really meant to be. Mm -hmm. And then all of a well, sudden... Well, they focus totally on whatever is not working, the dysfunction, the pain, the hurt, the grief, whatever is going on. And they kind of, you can get so tunnel vision right. on that where right. every day that's all you see and you can't see who you really are, the whole picture of yourself. Right. And so the great privilege of therapy uh, is that we get to show people their whole self over gradually and over time um, and in the increments people can handle and mm -hmm. when you see people glue the broken pieces back on and they're like I'm really great <laughs> I really like myself it's gonna be okay and, and granted there's a lot of complexity that can go with that but ultimately that's the point isn't mm -hmm. it is that we're, we're becoming more true well you know i think that mental illness has such a stigma to it and even that word i'm saying that thinking okay does that mean if i go get counseling i'm mentally ill mm -hmm. and there's such a fear about that and i know there was for me i mean i was to the place where i just didn't care what you labeled me just help because i'm so desperate i'll i'll crawl on my knees i'll beg i don't care what it is that call me whatever <laughs> that was your killer combo because you were smart enough to know you needed something and kind of relentless enough to, to fight for it and and that is a that's that quality in human beings if we saw that everywhere you know we would have we would have a, a much more uh, productive, peaceful uh, society at large. Well, I know so. that I was terrified to be diagnosed or labeled mm -hmm. like depressed, anxious, uh, whatever, you know, right. the sleep issues that I've had. Yeah. And I did take meds for these for a while. And can you talk about that just a little bit that, you know, I consider mm -hmm. that, yeah, I, yeah. Had a, I had a stint of what you might call mental illness. I don't know whether, it, but there's different types of mental illness. Sometimes it's like circumstantial, sometimes it's genetic. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference there? Because that seems odd to me. I, I grew up just always feeling like I was totally healthy and okay, but then life just kind of happened upon me wave after wave after wave. And I felt like I was dying. I didn't know how, I didn't have the skills or the tools. You know, I I guess there are two concepts there. One, if it's okay, I say that um, you know, with regard to your situation. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, you have free reign. Read my know, chart. Really, yeah. <laughs> you were circumstantially depressed. You know, so you were circumstantially anxious, meaning that I don't know that you had a strong genetic um, component that catapulted you into what became days and days and months and so forth that where it was hard to get out of bed. Um, and, and that's pretty evident in the fact that you had never had any depressive stint prior and you right. haven't had one since. Right. So in Just fact, a few years. <laughs> well, in, in, in those few years, what we were recovering you from was years of, of mistaken beliefs born of trauma, abandonment, um, you know, a tremendous amount of verbal abuse and, um, <clears throat> so in confusion about what God expected of you in that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so I think that coming out of that was a little bit like you needed to go back into a chrysalis, you know, and then, then break out of that chrysalis into your true self. And I did. I really saw it that way for you. You just had to hibernate and rest, so that the so that the truth could sink in mm -hmm. because it had been such a compulsive push. Yeah. All the time to be available and be everything to all people. Um, because, you know, even during the time where you're seeking counseling, you were also heading up your church's ministries and women's groups and Bible studies and 
handling a bunch of stuff going with your children and, and your marriage and mm -hmm. then you were entertaining and hosting authors and their books and doing huge you know seminars so you were at a high capacity full tilt and when the truth became really um at least that's what i saw and when the truth became more than we could manage and compulsively push through your body just goes oh i can't you know. do this anymore but it was a it was a rest you know well and, and, I, and that's I, how i saw the counseling know. i mean the, the sessions felt to me like you know so many times i could just let everything down and and express the fear and the anxiety and i i was able to you helped me like put words to it which when it feels like unknown and just out there, it, that was terrifying to me because I didn't understand why it was happening and I had all these feelings and I, I couldn't put words to them. Which kind of leads me to the differentiation between circumstantially mm -hmm. getting depressed um, or situationally being depressed and or anxious and even having trouble with attention and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, and then being you know truly genetically predisposed mm -hmm. and and it takes just a handful of some stressful situations where the person um, would probably, we would say were dysthymic or maybe had a low grade depression and then they had a couple of uh, little T, big T traumas, whatever it may have been. And then now they, they really- Kind of feels like it pushes you over right, the edge. Right, pushes you over yeah. the edge. And so what, it, it, so the differentiating quality there is that just naming it isn't enough. Mm -hmm. They are not, they, they will say, I know what you're saying and I know you're validating me and all of that and that's great and I'm still not doing well. It doesn't um, matter that it's understood mm -hmm. and all of that. I mean, for me, it's not mm -hmm. like it pulled me out of it, just naming mm -hmm. it, but it helped me to bear with it, mm -hmm. I think, and, and continue the work and Sometimes it was just a matter of coming in and sitting in that, like you called it a cocoon, sitting in that space and, and just feeling like I was okay, even if I felt crazy. Right. It was okay to be crazy in that moment. And knowing that I had that time every week to come in and just kind of be um, safe mm -hmm. in that place. and read it. But it took a long time to kind of rebuild myself yeah. and know that, I could come out of that safety and, and find well, new and tools. And you needed medicine during that time. Right, I did. Um, and, and, and during a time you otherwise didn't. Right. So um, so that's how medicine would be useful. Now, some people will tell me, I don't know what's wrong. Nothing particularly wrong has occurred. I just don't feel well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've tried to be very careful just because I'm in mental health. I don't break all problems down as mental health problems sometimes right. people are truly eating things they're allergic to right sometimes they are dealing with hormone imbalances unrelated to the brain per se so i do encourage a real thorough workup um if people and i do my assessment i'm finding that they do have something that is in fact a mental illness like anxiety depression bipolar bipolar one and bipolar two very different but require similar medications mm -hmm. um any kind of attention deficit um, issue and I don't like the word attention deficit. The concept deficit really doesn't fit. It's really inconsistency. That people have attention, they just don't know it's going to come and go. So, right. As an advocate, I do well, like and it that. can but, be very um, hyper focused sometimes. So, yeah. And, yeah so. and so when they're coming in not feeling well, and I don't look at the medicine and I don't look at the amino acids or the vitamins they need, I feel like I'm asking them as a therapist to go jogging on sprain angles. You know, we have to get those angles fixed. I mean, we I just feel like it's unethical not to. Uh, I also notice that people make huge progress when they're feeling like their brain's working, you know? Right. And I know that sounds so logical as I say <laughs> right before yeah, you. If your brain's yeah, working, life's a lot easier. But believe it or not, I had someone in the office today whose mother's receiving mental health counseling um, elsewhere in the state, and her therapist is, is trying to treat her PTSD and bipolar one without medication. And, you know, and it's just, again, it's like asking someone to go jogging, in her case, on two broken ankles and a broken femur, well, you know, so, so you just so can't sometimes, expect their clients to just do that. Right, and sometimes, like for me, what I found was the medication did help. And what it helped with was it just kind of lifted me enough 
it's not like they call them happy pills but there was no happiness in there this was not like you go from i can't get out of bed to Ooh, let's party it's not like that yeah but it helps you get out of bed so yeah. you can go do the work and yeah. i think that's the piece that a lot of people don't understand is sometimes people will get medication from their primary care physician yeah. or whatever yeah. and then they don't get help right well you're not going to get any better the medication is not there to make you better. It, mm -hmm. it may provide some stability for you for a while so that you can work on the issues and, and heal yourself. Right, absolutely. So, you know, if you don't have sprained ankles when you're going jogging, you might still have a hard time jogging so you work up to it, but you can do it. It doesn't right. hurt so bad. So people describe having proper medication as like having armor on. Right. They just feel like they're a little bit more protected and connected to themselves rather than so distracted by their anxiety. Well, and I love the way that you work with people too because you do work on things such as food. Mm -hmm. You do work on things such as your physical health. You know, mm -hmm. if you're eating a whole bunch of sugar and preservatives and all of this kind of stuff and then struggling from ADD, well, duh. Right. You know, first clean up, get the toxins right. out of your life because that does impact your brain and a lot of these things can be dealt with in ways other than pharmaceuticals. Yes, absolutely. And some people are really, um, the, the reactions to the medicine are so uh, intense that it's just not worth it. And right. so, and what, would I, what do I exactly mean by that? You know, people just feel numb. Mm -hmm. um, and they feel numb on a very low dose. But what I would say is that just because one classification of medication doesn't work for you, it doesn't mean no medicine works for you. Mm -hmm. Because there are many classifications for medicine that helps the brain because right. we have a complex system in that brain. Right. Um, so I do encourage people not to give up just because one medicine didn't take care of it. Right. Um, and that I, you know, I, I pretty ups I, you know, I feel sorry to say that I, I, you know, apologize on behalf of mental health, <laughs> uh, that we don't have say a blood test that says, here's the medicine. You this is the one you should be um, on. <clears throat> while some advances are taking place with um, specs and other, um, you know, emission uh, photos for the brain, it's still not a complete um, yeah. match necessarily. Right. So it is a slightly experimental. Now, do you find that a lot of clients need medication or, I mean, because I think this may be a hindrance for some people coming in for counseling. Sure, They're sure, thinking, sure. I, I'm not going to do medication, yeah. so therefore I don't want to go see a counselor because they're going to tell me I need to be on medication okay. and I don't yeah. want to do that. What should somebody like that do? Well, I, you know, it's almost like if they have a virus, you know, and but they really want to not have the virus and they really don't want to treat the virus, then the therapist has to, to tell them, here's realistically what we can handle. Mm -hmm. And but with that virus, we really can't push you any further than this. Mm -hmm. um, so if someone is so adamant about not looking at the physiology, then they're, they're missing a key component to say, greasing the wheels for mm -hmm. their progress. Mm -hmm. um, it's like not putting gas in the car because you don't believe in gasoline. You know, it's like, well, I appreciate that, but you're going to have to accept that or you probably shouldn't dive into that world. Now, I'm not saying every person by any stretch has to feel medicine. Right. They don't necessarily, not everyone needs medicine. Um, so for the most part though, we are looking at trying to create awareness that if that's needed, there are amino acids, there are vitamins. And I always, for people who are concerned about meds, we start more yeah. in that world. I remember um, you, you talked to me about supplements. We talked about uh -huh. food, yeah. you know, and truly at that time, I was, I feel like I was so far gone that I almost couldn't hear yeah. what you were saying. It was like, and it felt like, so everyone's oh, different. you want to give me a piece the of chewing gum? You know? yeah. yeah, yeah. So everyone's really different. And, and so I think the individualizing plans and, and responding to people's sensitivity is always our job as therapists. We cannot bully anyone into anything. Mm -hmm. Then we're not therapists anymore. Right. So we, as therapists, I believe in starting with honor and you honor those questions. And I, I want to honor those questions. And I also, um, you know, ultimately I can't make those decisions for them. But if they're seeking therapy to get through a situation, sometimes when people, um, when they realize the, the daunting task, if you will, of therapy, um, there is sometimes people kind of come to a belief like, I think I do need something to calm myself down. Right. 
just until I get through this portion of it. And then I we look at, you know, experimentally taking them off of it off of it, but the doctors are involved in all right. that. Um, so, well, I remember one thing and we're going to have you back. So I'm excited to have you come back and, and talk with us again. And, uh, but what I thought we would leave with is I remember you saying to me, wouldn't it be great if people would come in when they're not in crisis? Sure. They absolutely. know that they have some issues yeah. going on. There's some past hurt. There's mm -hmm. some past stuff going on. And they notice it's kind of still impacting yes. them today. And they want to figure out how do I live a healthier life right but they're not in crisis well said and that's what i would encourage people a lot of times you think well it's not horrible so i don't need to go so you wait until it does get horrible and the thing is if you don't deal with it it will because right. the next time some the next time you have a loss the next right. time something kind of blows you over you won't have this the capacity to handle it if you haven't dealt with all the other stuff well, and it's like waiting to confront someone in the heat of battle. Right. It's better to to confront something when there's peace. People right. are just more available. And right. So well, and your attitude is probably a little bit more compassionate. You're not all upset and riled and all of that. So, yeah. anyway, well, right. thank you so much, Maria. This has That's been great. great. Thank you. <laughs> so appreciate you having you awesome. having you here. Absolutely. Try that again. <laughs> it's been an honor. Thank you. And we'll see you next time here on Broken and Brilliant.